Now I've mentioned before that 1 Corinthians is a letter that deals exclusively with church-related issues and uh, problems. Uh, it, could be subtitles, it could be subtitled Answers to Common Problems in the Church because for 2,000 years uh, we've used this particular letter to deal with problems that arise in the church. It doesn't matter where you are. Someone said to me once, because you know, I've worked at different churches, well, how is it different working here than working over there or working in Canada, working in the United States? And uh, my answer is not much different because most churches are the same. The type of problems that arise in the congregation are, tend to be similar from congregation to congregation. The place changes, the size changes, perhaps the culture changes, but the issues that arise among brethren tend to be the same. That's why this letter is so uh, important and so valuable. Anyways, in chapter 12, Paul uses a figure to describe what the church is like and how it functions. And the figure that he uses is that of the human body. Verse 12. Now in our lesson today, I'd like to review some of the reasons why the body, the human body, is the perfect figure to represent the, uh, to represent the church. Now in the Bible there are over 50, there are more than 50 different figures used to refer to the church or to God's people. For example, in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22, the church or the, you know, the, the God's people referred to as the city of the living, uh, the city of the living God. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 3, another passage in the same epistle we're studying, uh, God, um, uh, uh, Paul rather, refers to the church as God's building. And in Zechariah, in the Old Testament, chapter eight, verse three, uh, the prophet says uh, of the people of God, they're the holy mountain of God. So all these different figures that we have throughout the Bible, always describing the same thing, which is the church or the people of God. So in each instance, the figure represents some aspect or some feature of the church that God was trying to accentuate. So when the Holy Spirit uses the human body as a figure, it's one of the 50, 50 plus. So when the Holy Spirit uses the, whole, uh, the human body as a figure for the church, He's trying to convey something very specific about the church. Actually, three particular things about the church that are not possible to convey using any other, any other figure in the Bible. And we're going to kind of look at this here, this imagery of the body used as a figure for Christ and His church. The first thing that uh, it represents is the glory of the church. In other words, using the human body is the perfect figure to express the glory, the, the glory that the church has. In Ephesians chapter five, verse 27, Paul says that Jesus wishes to present to God the glorious church. No other figure quite captures the gloriousness of the church than the figure of the human body. I mean, in Genesis, we read that God creates time and He creates space, He creates matter, He creates the elements, and He builds on these to fashion the form of the earth and the heavenly bodies. Scientists are still you know, being amazed by the wonders yet discovered under the seas, and they estimate that there are, there are literally billions of, of stars. And they're amazed by that. We have programs on TV that show us the latest discoveries, new animal types that are being discovered, new stars, various features of stars and planets. And yet, as wonderful and awe-inspiring as they are, in Genesis we read that God created living creatures at the end that surpassed these in the fact that they could perceive themselves and actually interact with the universe, with the environment. No star, no planet interacts with its environment. And as overwhelming 
as the number of stars are, the life experienced by animate creatures such as animals and birds are still more wondrous than a zillion inanimate stars. You see what I'm saying? You know, the, the creation level, the wonder level, the complexity level keeps going up and up. But then as a crowning act, God creates a being that is made in His own image. I mean, animals could perceive themselves and others, but God created a creature that could perceive God and relate to Him. And so for all these other things, you know, the stars, the earth, the vegetation, the animals, God merely spoke and they came into existence. You know, in Genesis 1.20 he says, let the waters teem with swarms of living creatures. And what happened? Well, they became present. They were created. But when it came to the being that was to exist in the image of God, the one who could see the stars, the one who could rule over the animals, God specifically formed a body. He didn't speak man into existence. He formed man. It's a different verb there, a different action. So the human body was a unique and separate act of creation and for this reason, only after the human body was created did God say, it is very good. Before that, he'd, see what, he'd look at what he had done and said, it's good. But after man was created, humans were created, he said, it is very good, Genesis 1.31. So far as the book of Genesis is concerned, the human body sits at the apex of God's creation. It's the peak. So when we look at things that were created, the human body is the very best of what God has done. So says the Bible. So good, in fact, that God Himself inhabited one. God didn't come in the form of an animal or even a you know, blazing star or speak out of a blazing. He took the form of a human. So you know, I'm, this is a lot of preamble here, but my point is that in order to signify how glorious and how marvelous is this thing called the church, God uses the figure of the human body to describe it. Now the human body is His most glorious creation in the natural world, a thing that we can see and appreciate, and so God uses this image to describe His most glorious creation in the spiritual world, the church. So He uses the human body to explain the glory of the church. He also uses the human body to explain the unity of the church. Now when I use the word unity, I don't mean the word conformity. There's a big difference between unity and conformity. Conformity is for ball bearings and widgets, right? Each one is designed and forced to look and feel and weigh exactly the same. No you know, deviation, no changes, no variations. You know? I have a, a friend, a brother in Christ, who is an, aer an aeronautic engineer in Montreal. He works for Bombardier. And I asked him, what's your job? He says, oh, I weigh, th I weigh things. I said, what do you mean, I weigh things? He says, I weigh every single item that goes into that plane. Every nut, every bolt, every spring, every needle, every fabric, every single thing that goes into the plane, my job is to weigh it, measure it, so that we have on record, because there's a weight limit, obviously. And if that ball bearing, you know, let's take for example, if that ball bearing, you know, the, if there are eight ball bearings, and the eighth one weighs more than the others, that one goes. They have, you know, as far as that part goes, it has to weigh exactly the same, it has to look the same, so on and so forth, as all the other ones. That's conformity, that's a good thing. You know, conformity is a good thing in its place. But when I use the word unity, I'm referring to the quality that the church possesses the way that each of its parts work together perfectly in order to make the entire unit function 
and grow. So in his letter, Paul points out this wonderful quality of the church by comparing it to the human body, which is infinitely complex, but functions in such a way that each part, no matter how small, no matter how great, no matter how different, is interconnected to all the other parts and has a very specific duty that contributes to the overall well-being of that body. That's what unity is. So these ideas <clears throat> are brought together or brought out in several epistles. You know, this is not the only place that Paul talks about unity. He talks about it in other places. Let's go to uh, Romans chapter 12, shall we? He says, for just as we have many members in one body and all the members do not have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. So in Romans, Paul contrasts the interconnectedness and the diversity of the body. We're all different, but we are all connected in some way. All right, if we go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, which was what we were looking at before. And let's read from uh, verse uh, 12, shall we? Pick up in verse 12, <clears throat> it says the following. For even as the body is one and yet has many members, and all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I am not part of the body, it is not for this reason any the less part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I am not part of the body, it is not for this reason any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But now God has placed the members, each one of them, in the body, just as He desired. And if they were all one member, where would the body be? It's kind of a long passage, but it's self-explanatory, isn't it? He demonstrates that cooperative nature of the body, where every part is in harmony, not in competition with every other part. And he says, every single part is necessary. And then in Ephesians chapter four, let's go to Ephesians chapter four, shall we, for a moment. In Ephesians chapter four, verse 16, he says, from whom the whole body being, fit, uh, being fitted and held together by that which every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. In Ephesians 4.16, Paul shows that not only are the parts connected, not only are the parts necessary, but each part makes a very specific contribution to the growth of the body. Everybody contributes. So the church described in the New Testament is united. And by using the human body as a figure to represent it, the, whole, the Holy Spirit is able to clearly demonstrate what unity means. He says it's, it's united, but what does that mean? Well, the first feature of biblical unity is interconnectedness. Each member is related through faith in Jesus Christ and hope of salvation and this is the connection that each one of us has to every other member. I mean here you know in our congregation it's rather homogeneous. You know we we, 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 you know, many of you uh, were born in Oklahoma or are, are born in the United States, Caucasian, have a similar history, you know, and so on and so forth, but go to other parts of the world, perhaps a very large cosmopolitan cities, well, like Montreal, for example, where we come from, and in a very small congregation of 100 people, you have up to 18 different nationalities. Sundays was always interesting. Our African brethren, the women would come in in their African dress, you know, with the big headdress and the very multicolored dresses and so on and so forth. And 
uh, people from uh, China would come, or on the days when we had potlucks. Oh boy, oh boy. <laughs> the thing I regretted about potlucks in Montreal, no fried chicken, but lots of rice dishes and lots of exotic dishes from different places. So it was hard to relate many times culturally to someone, I mean, I knew a lady in Montreal who in her, she came from a family uh, 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 that was polygamous. In other words, her father had five wives. She lived in Africa. And, and you know, eventually he became a Christian and, and, and what he taught his children were not to be polygamous. And she would talk about my mother number one and my mother number three and my, num my mother number five. You know, and that was her experience. Well, I couldn't even relate to that experience. But the thing that related myself to this black woman from Africa who had such a different history than mine is that one day she realized that Jesus Christ was the Son of God and she gave her life to Him. She, was, you know, she talked about the day she was baptized, I talked about the day I was baptized. See, we were different, but our point of connection was, was Christ. Our point of connection was Christ. So, Everyone equally shares a history of being saved and a future of eternal life with God. That's, that's how we are connected. Even though we may not be able to relate to each other culturally for some reason or other, or even socially, or financially, or educationally, maybe we have all different backgrounds, we all meet at the point of Christ. And that's what real unity is all about. It's the recognition that each of us has a similar history when it comes to Jesus Christ. That's the thing, by the way, that makes you feel at home. You travel, you go to, I don't know, Wyoming, or you go to California. Oh, it's so different here. And then you walk into the church on the Lord's Day, and all of a sudden, you know, you're like, yeah, it feels like home, exactly. Another feature of unity, figured by the term of the body, uh, is diversity. So within unity you have interconnectedness and you have diversity. Although each is connected, there is room for individuality. Not everybody thinks, not everybody acts, not everybody understands in the same way or at the same pace. And that's what Paul is trying to explain here in 1 Corinthians. Not every organ and member of a human body looks the same or grows at the same rate but it's still part of the body. In the same way, not every member of the church looks or acts or grows at the same pace, but nevertheless, they belong to the church. You know, so many times you know, we, we, we get this idea that there are like the first class members and the second class members and the third class members and we base it on things that we shouldn't base it on at all. That's how little cliques form in the church, some feeling superior to others for some reason or other, because they have a longer history, they have more responsibility. But in the church there's diversity. And sometimes the diversity is between those who are very mature because they've followed Christ for a long time and so on and so forth, and others who are just coming in to Christ and who are just learning. Equally valuable, however diverse. And then the third feature of biblical unity, you know, we have interconnectedness, we have diversity, and the third feature that Paul talks about is function. There is a role for every member of the church, and each role is necessary for the overall growth and well-being of the church. Each role is necessary. You know, um, you, you, I mean, those of us who work in the building or maybe have reason to come here often or at night, uh, we see uh, uh, Gail Morgan, for example, uh, because she does a lot of her work at night. And we don't see her. Hal and I were here you know, working on lighting for something we're going to, a project we're working on, and, and there, was, uh, there was Gail, you know, vacuuming, getting the books ready, and so on and so forth. We never see Gail. We never see her doing her work, her contribution. But I guarantee you, if Gail stopped doing what she did, we'd start noticing it. Hey, where's the toilet paper? <laughs> no toilet paper. We're, 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 the, we're the hand towels. 
The soap thing is empty. How come all the books are strewn all over the place? What's that food there uh, you know, between the, shouldn't be by the way, shouldn't be, but anyways, what's that food on the floor in the auditorium? And, and so on and so on. Have we ever seen anyone change a light bulb here? Probably very few of us have ever witnessed it be happening, but I guarantee you there's somebody that goes around and changes the light bulbs. And if that person didn't do their job, you know, it would be like broken teeth. Half of these lights wouldn't be working. So function. You don't produce unity by forcing everybody to think and act and grow and do exactly the same thing. You know, we're maybe three to four hundred people here. If 350 people here said, hey, my job's to change the lights. <laughs> well, we'd have, we'd have a bright auditorium, but that's about it. We don't want conformity. Conformity is manipulation. We want unity. That's what Paul is arguing. He's arguing against conformity. There were some in the church trying to force others to conform to what they thought how things ought to be done. The only conformity that we're shooting for is what? We're trying to conform to this. But no one member can force another member to conform to what they think, how things ought to be. So how do you produce this unity? Very important. And my argument here is you don't produce unity by forcing conformity. You, you form unity, first of all, by celebrating our interconnectedness. Anybody know what we call celebrating our interconnectedness? Yeah, it's called worship. <laughs> we celebrate our interconnectedness. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 16 and 17, Paul says, is not the cup of blessing which we bless a sharing in the blood of Christ? Is not the bread which we break a sharing in the body of Christ? You know, worship has a, a, a vertical purpose. You know, and we often say, we're here you know, for God. We're here to worship God. That's the vertical purpose. And in the vertical purpose, we, we conform to what God has given us in the Bible. We sing, we, we take the communion, we, we preach His word. You know, this is the vertical relationship. But worship also has a horizontal feature to it. And the horizontal feature is where we are working on unity. We celebrate together our vertical relationship with God. Worship's horizontal purpose is the celebration of our interconnectedness in Christ. That's what Paul is saying here. When we share the bread, aren't we all sharing the same loaf? Don't we break it off the same loaf? And figuratively, he's talking about Christ. Aren't we all sharing the Christ here? And when we take the cup, unfortunately some think that taking the cup here, they interpret this as we, all, we only have to have one cup that goes around, but Paul is talking about the same idea that he was talking about with the bread. Isn't it the same cup of wine, the blood of Christ? Isn't that what we're sharing? Isn't that what brings us together? The same blood that covers my sins, covers your sins and your sins and your sins. Isn't that what we're sharing? There's the horizontal. So when I sing, I hear your voice and my voice mingle together to create unity. Unity to complete the vertical relationship that I have to worship God, but at the same time the horizontal relationship that I have with my brothers and my sisters through worship. Um, another way that we create this unity, and I might add for the first point, that's one of the reasons why the elders encourage us to be faithful in our attendance. You know, it's the old story, it's not a checklist, it's we celebrate together. And being together often uh, promotes this unity that we have. Another way of creating this unity is accepting each other's diversity within the body. Let's go to Romans this time, chapter 14. Paul says, let not him who eats regard with contempt him who does not eat. And let not him who does not eat judge him who eats, for God has accepted him. Who are you to judge the servant of another? 
denouncing the differences between us destroys our unity. Now, should we denounce sin? Absolutely. You know, if my brother or my sister is sinning, and I mean truly sinning, then I have to ex exhort that brother or sister. Why? Because out of love I, I want to preserve their soul. I don't want them to go off uh, and, and either leave the church or sin in such a way that they would put their soul in danger. But you know what? That, that, you know, in my experience, I found that most of the times we're criticizing and denouncing each other for things that have nothing to do with sin, have more to do with personal ego issues or the way we do things. He sings too loud when he leads. He sings too soft when he leads. He preaches too long, he preaches too short. She didn't say hello, that's two Sundays, she just walked right by, she didn't even greet me. You know, where? And we denounce each other for those type of things and what we're doing is we're putting a crack in the, in the unity that, that we have. And then another way to promote unity is to promote the value of each other's contribution to the whole. The fastest way to build the body is by praising your brother's work. Not denouncing it or criticizing it or speculating over it, but praising them for their work. Goes a lot further than criticism. When they review people who, um, you know, uh, what do they call it, the out counseling, when someone uh, leaves a, a job or something, they quit and so on and so forth. And they go to a, they go looking for another job and so they exit counseling, that's it, exit interview, thank you. Uh, so the exit interview. And one of the things most mentioned about employees who are disgruntled or discouraged and going somewhere else was the fact that they received very little encouragement. It didn't happen very often that the boss or the supervisor or the manager, whoever, you know, whoever is over you, comes and says, I appreciate what you're doing. You, and not an empty compliment. I think that thing or that report that you handed in or that change that you made, I thought that was a very good, a very good thing. And I appreciate you as an employee. And, uh, you know, and so on and so forth. You know? People are starved for encouragement. Well, you'd think in the church, I mean, this is the place where there, there ought to be encouragement. Many times members leave, you know, we, we don't have exit interviews, but a lot of times elders, ministers kind of will go to someone's house and ask them, you know, well, how, how come you're not coming? Or is there a problem why you're going to this other congregation and you've left ours? And a lot of times the thing is, it's exactly that. You know, I just, I was working and doing this and doing that and I, you know, I've taught Sunday school for three years and I haven't had a break. Not, not one person said to me, thank you for your work. Not one person came into my class and, and asked, Do, could you use some help? And eventually they just burn out. And the only way they can protect themselves from burning out is just to go somewhere else. And unfortunately, when they go somewhere else, what do they do? They hide, they sit in the pew and you know, if I don't make a move, then nobody will volunteer me for something. That's terrible. So promoting the value of each other's contribution to the whole is a way of building up the unity in the church. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians, therefore encourage one another and build up one another. So the body is the perfect symbol to represent the dynamic element of unity represented in the church. Okay, so the body demonstrates, oh, we gotta move. Uh, the body demonstrates perfectly the glory of the church, the unity of the church, and then thirdly, the position of Christ. The church is related to, united to, connected to the divine Savior, Jesus Christ, who is the Son of God. He is the living Lord, and so any symbol or figure used to represent an intricate part of His nature must itself be alive, and here's the key point. It must also be alive with the same life that Jesus has. Now in other places, the church is referred to in various ways, as I said. In Hebrews, it's referred to as a city. In Ezekiel 34, as a flock. In 1 Corinthians, as a temple or a building. In Deuteronomy 32, verse nine, as a portion. All of these and others signify various aspects of the Lord's relationship with His people, but only in the use of the body as a figure do we clearly see the three main truths regarding God's position in the church. 
First of all, He is the head of the church. Colossians chapter 1, 18. Right? Jesus is the head of the body, which is the church, or the head of the church, which is His body. So there's one leader of the church, and that's Jesus Christ. That each human body has one head is easily seen and understood. You know, when I was a little kid, I went to a carnival, and they have uh, you know, all kinds, see the bearded lady, see the alligator man, see the baby with two heads. And of course it was, you know, probably twins and arrested the development in the womb, so on and so forth, but they had this very grotesque thing in a jar, you know, and it was a baby that had two heads. And it was like, oh, you know, when they, when they lifted, I remember we had to pay a like quarter to get in to see all these marvels. And when we went in, you know, the, the guy says, and now, you know, and he lifted the, the, the black drape over the jar, you know, and I mean, there was an audible, <gasps> oh, you know, it was like, wow. You know, a body only has one head. Well, that's the perfect figure for Christ, the relationship between Christ and His church. This natural phenomenon is an absolutely perfect reflection of the natural position of Jesus with His church. Now, there are many diverse members with many functions. There is clearly only one head and that position is not shared or challenged by any of the members. The hand doesn't want to be a head. The foot doesn't want to be a head. Only the head is the head. Secondly, Jesus is the nourisher of the church. Colossians chapter 2, uh, verse 19. And not holding fast to the head, from whom the entire body being supplied and held together by the joints and ligaments grows with a growth which is from God. So science explains to us that the central center for the body is the brain contained in the head. Our body functions, our feelings and thoughts, our reactions are all controlled and initiated by the brain. We could lose almost every organ and member of our body and continue to be alive or to be conscious. They had a program the other day about these soldiers who had been injured and it's terrible. You know, some of them, just, it's just terrible. You know, they've lost both arms and both legs. You know, they're just a torso and a, and a head and, and death. You know, and yet the person is still talking and still feeling and still communicating. He's still alive. Lost all of his major members. So the body can do that. But if our brain is damaged, the entire body goes to waste. I, I just finished reading that book by Bill O'Reilly on the, the, the killing of, of Lincoln. And he describes you know, the, uh, the, uh, the wound that he suffered. Uh, it was a single shot to the back of the head, you know, a little small uh, ball, it wasn't a bullet, it was a, a ball, it came from a Derringer. And they described this little tiny ball, you know, just went into the brain and it went into the brain perhaps three or four inches, but that was, that was enough to kill him. And yet we have a soldier stepping on a, a mine, blowing off his arms, his legs, uh, you know, uh, he loses his hearing and he's still alive, he's still talking and yet that little bullet, if it went into the brain and just a few inches, so the brain is central. What a perfect analogy for the position of Christ and His church. He provides everything we need for the life of the body of the church and without Him we couldn't function. We can lose members, we can damage different body parts, but the body itself continues to be. Jesus Himself alluded to this when He said, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit from, and apart from me you can do how much? Nothing, you can't do a thing. Of course, He's referring to His headship here, John 15 verse five. Then finally, He is united to the church, a figure of Jesus' the way He's united to the church in Ephesians 4, 15 and 16. Think about this now. Jesus has always existed. John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He's always existed. The church has not always existed because it is made of humans, and humans came into existence with Adam. Genesis chapter 1. Keep that in mind. Now the church is united to Christ and has become part of His being. See where I'm going here? John 17, 22 and 23. Jesus always was, the church came into existence at a particular time, 
But now over here, Jesus and the church are one unit. Now I don't claim to understand completely the dynamics of our relationship with the Lord, but the head on a human body is not detachable. It is part of the body, it is one with the body. So the use of the body as a figure for the church can also reveal to us that God so loved us that He attached us into the Godhead through Jesus Christ. Think about that for a second. This concept could not have been conveyed in any other way but by using the human body as a mirror of the nature of the Godhead accomplished through the incarnation and resurrection of Jesus Christ and then Him becoming eternally attached to the church by becoming His head. You see what I'm saying? There was a time when the church was not attached to Him. And then there came a time when the church was attached to Him. And now the church is and will always be attached to Him. Think about the, the change that has taken place here, not just for us, but for Him. You know, there's a symmetry in the Bible. There are no wasted words or motion. Every idea and symbol carefully plotted to reveal the marvelous plan of God to save man through, through Jesus. So the creation of the human body was God's greatest revealed achievement and it is fitting that the human body also be used as a figure for God's final revealed creation. And God's final revealed creation is the church of Christ. Through this symbol, God is able to reveal to human eyes and minds the glory of the church, the unity of the church, and the relationship of His church to Himself. Not only are we one with Christ, but He has condescended to become one with us. That's the marvel. One other idea conveyed by the use of the body, and that is less obvious at first glance, let me finish with this. Only the body, the human body, is alive with human life. Animals, no matter how powerful, Stars, no matter how numerous, water, no matter how deep, do not share the consciousness of life that, that is evident in human life. Only human beings are human. Well, in the same way, only the body of Christ is alive spiritually. Religion, no matter how zealous or old, philosophy, no matter how complex, do not have the life that only the church or the body of Christ has. And my point here, my final point is, the figure of the body demonstrates this perfectly. Okay, so there's some ideas about how the figure of the human body is used to demonstrate the relationship between Christ and His church and our relationship between one and another. And that's it for today. Thank you very much for your, uh, for your attention.